Hi guys, Claudia Berlin here, and today we're going to talk about the 19th of May, 1536. So today is Anne Boleyn's execution, and that marks the end of our series. Now I hope that in giving you a video every day, I've managed to portray to you quite how fast this fall was. Just 18 days ago, it was May Day, Anne Boleyn was at the joust. She has fallen in just over two weeks. And I think this story of the destruction of a queen on false charges is so dramatic, so melodramatic, that it can be hard to think of it as real. But before we get into it, I just want to read you some information about humanity on the planet. You might think, <laughs> how does that link to Anne Boleyn? Um, I want you to think about how close we actually are to the Tudors as people, because they really weren't that long ago. They seem to us like very distant history because of the way we learn about them in school. But in terms of the timeline of humans on Earth, we are so close to them. So Anne Boleyn was executed only 484 years ago today. So think about that in terms of human lifetime. That's about seven human lifetimes. My maths isn't great. So we're looking at something that happened less than 500 years ago. Okay, so here are my statistics. The Earth is four billion years old. The first humans, as we would recognise them, appeared on Earth 300,000 years ago. And in terms of our universe, what the science tells us is that humans have only existed in the most recent 0.002% of time. The Tudors are practically our cousins, they're our neighbours. When future humans look back at history, we're going to be seen as very close to the Tudors. We're not really going to be perceived as that much different. We've got more technology, thankfully we've got more human rights, we've got democracy, but in terms of the way we lived and our emotions and how we related to each other, we're extremely close. So I hope that through this series, talking to you about Anne and George, I've been able to give you not just the facts about them, but also speculate on their personalities and their relationship, because I want people to think of them as real human beings that didn't exist too long ago. And as interesting as this story is, it's all very Game of Thrones, you know, it does attract a lot of interest because it is so incredible, almost unbelievable. We can't lose sight of the fact that this story centres on the murder of an innocent woman, the murder of her innocent brother and her innocent friends. These are murders. So I want to begin our story of the 19th with quite an unlikely person, actually. So we're going to begin with a man called Alexander Ailes, and he's a Scottish Lutheran and theologian that is staying in London at the time of Anne Boleyn's downfall and execution. This is a man that, because he's a Lutheran, he admires Anne Boleyn. He'd seen her at court before. Later on in life, he's actually going to be commissioned by Elizabeth I, Anne's daughter, to write up a document of Anne's final weeks of life. But on the 19th, Alexander Ailes hadn't left his house for quite a long time. He's got a house in London. He wasn't aware of the proceedings against Anne in detail. He knew that she was experiencing a fall, but he didn't know the exact details of any of this. Now, he has a terrible nightmare in the early hours of the 19th of May. Now, he later wrote about this experience to Elizabeth I, so that's Anne's daughter, in a letter. And I want to read you what he said to her. Oh, for this, by the way, I am reading from Alison Weir's The Lady in the Tower. So, Alex Alexander wrote to Elizabeth, I take to witness Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, that I am about to speak the truth. On the day on which the Queen was beheaded, at sunrise, between two and three o'clock, there was revealed to me, whether I was asleep or awake, I know not, the Queen's neck, after her head had been cut off, and this so plainly that I could count the nerves, the veins, and the arteries. Terrified by this dream or vision, I immediately arose, and crossing the River Thames I came to Lambeth, the Archbishop of Canterbury's palace, and I entered the garden in which he was walking. Evidently Cranmer too had had trouble sleeping, and was also disturbed in his mind. When the Archbishop saw me, he inquired why I had come so early, for the clock had not yet struck four. I answered that I had been horrified in my sleep, and I told him the whole occurrence. He continued in silent wonder for a while. Do you not know what is to happen today? Cranmer asked. And Ailes answered that he had remained at home since the date of the Queen's imprisonment and knew nothing of what was going on. The Archbishop then raised his eyes to heaven and said, She who has been the Queen of England upon earth will today become a Queen in heaven. And so great was his grief that he could say nothing more. 
and then he burst into tears. Terrified at this announcement, I returned to London, sorrowing. Now, if this is true, it tells us that Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, who Anne was a patron of, who got his position as Archbishop of Canterbury because of the Boleyn family, it tells us that he's so devastated by what is to come and probably feeling great guilt because remember, he's been forced to take part in this as well. This man is weeping. He is that devastated and upset by what's going on. Now, remember, it was Cranmer who was sent by Cromwell to see Anne and talk to her about making her marriage invalid. And we don't know what was said, but at the end of that meeting, she was in hope of life and she seemed more cheerful. She'd been pleased to see him. It's also believed by some historians that Cranmer was present yesterday when Anne Anne swore on the sacrament in front of William Kingston and claimed her innocence. So Thomas Cranmer was a friend and supporter of Anne's anyway, and now he's seen her swearing to her innocence, he knows that an innocent woman is being put to death and that he's been forced to take part in this. Remember that Thomas Cranmer, as the Archbishop of Canterbury, is able to protect reformers and try and make the country more reformist. If he loses his position by standing up for Anne, then they'll most likely replace him with a more traditional Catholic Archbishop, and the country could go back to where it was. Now, the fact that Alexander Ayless writes this to Queen Elizabeth I shows us that Elizabeth I, Anne's daughter, has an enduring interest in the story of her mother. When Elizabeth is queen, she can't openly call her father a monster because he was Henry VIII. She is his heir, well, one of his heirs. But it seemed that in her personal life, she took great strength and solace in the memory of her mother and her plight. So on the morning of the 19th, Anne wakes up quite early. She's said to have breakfast at seven and she celebrates mass for the last time with her almoner called John Skip. So she takes the sacrament again. Now at this point, some sources tell us that Anne has been allowed to have her own ladies around her. Now sources do differ on this, but what we know is that she was attended by four young ladies. That's what eyewitnesses have said. Now there is a legend that one of these girls, one of these young ladies, was actually Catherine Carey. Now Catherine Carey was the daughter of Mary Boleyn, so Mary Boleyn is Anne's older sister. And some historians actually believe that Catherine Carey was Henry VIII's daughter from the time when Mary was his mistress. And actually, later on in life, Catherine will become a great friend and supporter of her cousin Elizabeth I. If you've read The Other Boleyn Girl, then you might be under the impression that Catherine Carey did serve Anne in the Tower and was there for her. And as nice a story as that is, I mean, obviously it's unpleasant that a young girl would have been in that situation, but I'm sure Anne would have wanted to have a family member around her. As nice as that story is, historians do think that's untrue. So after Anne's had her breakfast, Master Kingston comes to see her at eight o'clock. Anne is said to have been waiting for his footsteps to approach by the door. Now when he comes, he tells her that the hour of her death is approaching. Now as terrible as that is, remember that Anne is now in a state where she longs for death. Her reputation's been ruined. Her daughter has been taken from her. Her brother has been murdered. No doubt she'll be blaming herself for the death of her brother and her friends. Anne is calm and composed when she hears this news. She's definitely ready to die at this point. So something interesting that we do know about this is we know the clothes that Anne chose to wear for her execution. So obviously she doesn't have the option of her usual sumptuous queenly wardrobe, but she can still make a statement with what she wears to her execution. So Alison Weir says in her book that according to a letter dated 10th of June 1536, written by a Portuguese observer who somehow had managed to witness what was going on, even though Cromwell wanted foreigners out of the picture because he didn't want them reporting back to their countries about Anne's mistreatment. He says that she was wholly habited in a robe of black damask made in such guise that the cape, which was white, did fall on the outer side thereof. He later refers to her cape being a short mantle furred with ermines, and the source Lancelot de Carles describes this as a white collar. She was wearing a gable hood, so um, in the famous portrait of Anne Boleyn, you will have seen that she wears a hood which is kind of ovalish, ovalish kind of circular shape, um, and it's quite far back on her head, and that's actually a French hood, and that's something that Anne brought into fashion when she was queen. The gable hood is slightly bigger, more boxy. I think it's considered to be more modest. So the Spanish Chronicle tells us that Anne wore a netted coif over her hair. So this is just a sort of cap that would keep your hair back behind your hood. And obviously when Anne's going to be executed, she wants to keep her hair back. We also have a description of a crimson kirtle underneath this robe and that it had a low neckline. So a Tudor kirtle is basically a sort of underdress. To us, it would look like an overdress. It just looks like a long 
dress that doesn't have long sleeves. You'd wear like an, an undergown underneath it or an undershirt. I'm not sure how to say that, but um, you'd have like a like an under part. And then it would look almost corsety here and go down as a long dress. I'm probably not describing that right, but that would have been quite plain. So that would have been on over her underclothes and it will have been under her gown but it would have been showing through so there is an idea among some historians that she chose to wear this red kirtle because red is the symbol of martyrdom also the fact she's wearing ermine is a statement because in tudor england there were rules about who could wear which fabrics and which furs because it was a sign of hierarchy and power so only royalty is allowed to wear ermine which is probably why anne is wearing it because although she can't speak against it she knows that she is a legitimate queen and that she didn't do anything wrong. I still can't get over quite how badly I've described that kirtle, so I've got a book on Tudor fashion, I'm going to quickly show you a kirtle in case you're interested. Oh, it describes it much better as well, so it says here that a kirtle is a garment consisting of bodice and skirt worn under a woman's gown. Uh, this book, by the way, is Tudor fashion by Ellery Lynn, a very interesting if you have an interest in Tudor fashion. Just to demonstrate this better, that is the red kirtle, so although that looks like a full outfit to us, that would go under. And then here, would be the dress that goes over that. So really that would only be just showing through. You can see that kirtle here is just showing through under that other gown. Now Anne is to die at nine o'clock. So this is when Kingston comes to fetch her for her final walk. Now Anne apparently says to Kingston, acquit yourself of your charge for I have been long prepared. So it's interesting that again, she seems to be reassuring Kingston this time. Kingston is actually quite disturbed by what's going on. He doesn't show it very much, but the way he reports on this later seems to imply quite a lot of sympathy for Anne. What she's essentially telling him is that I know this is your job, I know that you have to do this, and I'm not going to make this difficult. Please don't worry, I'm ready for death. And this is the same thing that Anne did with her ladies yesterday. She assured them that she was fine, it was going to be okay. And I think that shows us the kindness in Anne Boleyn's character, because she's not often known for being kind, often because the stories we have of Anne come back to us from her enemies. But we do know that Anne could have a temper, and sometimes she could be quite spiteful. But she does have this kindness, this compassion. We see this in her concern for Mark Smeaton, who has essentially taken part in dooming her to death. You know, she has got this real admirable quality within her, and I wish more people knew about that. So I told you before that the King has allowed Anne to have £20 that she's going to distribute to the poor, so Kingston gives her this. Now usually at a Tudor execution, you would actually pay your executioner. That sounds really odd to us, but it's almost as if they're doing a service for you, they are dispatching you as best they can, so you want to thank them for their time and trying to make it as painless as possible. Now some sources say that with Anne's execution this was arranged beforehand so she didn't have to pay her executioner, but we do have some sources that say that she did pay her executioner so we're not completely sure. Now the Spanish Chronicle, and remember that this is, it's quite a notoriously unreliable source. Um, it usually gets the gist of a situation, but the specifics are often wrong, and actually sometimes quite wildly wrong. But the Spanish Chronicle and Eustace Chapuis both report that apparently in the lead up to her death, Anne thought a lot about her treatment of the Lady Mary. So that's Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon's daughter. Anne essentially became her stepmother. It was a tremendously sad time for Lady Mary because she was made illegitimate and she lost her father's favour. But um, also there's a idea in history that Anne did this, she was like the wicked stepmother. There's a brilliant video um, by Claire Ridgway about this, which I'm going to put in the description box, um, if you want to hear more about these ideas of Anne as a wicked stepmother, which she very cleverly squashes, and she looks at it from a very human, compassionate standpoint. But certainly Anne could have done more for Mary, and there's also the sense of Anne now thinking about her own daughter Elizabeth, who's soon going to be in a similar situation. Elizabeth is going to become illegitimate, just like Mary was. So Anne is then escorted by William Kingston out to the scaffold. Now it's not too far to the scaffold, Anne Boleyn was actually executed within the tower grounds. So Anne's scaffold would have been draped with black cloth, and there would have been straw strewn all over the floor on this scaffold because they needed to catch the blood. So who is present at this execution? We have Thomas Cromwell there. Um, he is there with his son Gregory. <laughs> a fun day out for all the family. And this is actually a scene in Wolf Hall. You see him at Anne's execution and he rather kindly urges her to put her hand down while she's fixing her hair because oh no, the execution might get botched. Sorry, I'm not going to talk about Walpole, but you know I have my issues with the portrayal of Thomas Cromwell in that. But Cromwell is there, the Duke of Sussex is present, he's someone who hates Anne. Now, as for Uncle Norfolk, 
he actually isn't here. Now, you would have expected him to be there for this, but remember that when he had to give the sentence to Anne and George, he actually started crying. Tears ran down his cheeks, and some people think those were crocodile tears. I actually think the fact that he's not here for this execution shows that he finds this quite traumatic and upsetting, and that he doesn't want to have to be there and see his sister's children killed. Also, Henry Fitzroy is present, so that is King Henry VIII's illegitimate son with his mistress Bessie Blount. This is a good situation for him, because Mary has been made illegitimate, now Elizabeth is going to be made illegitimate. That means that as a male heir, Henry Fitzroy now stands even closer to the throne. Remember that Henry Fitzroy as well actually wrote to Cromwell well about how he could benefit from the fall of Anne and George and the other men by having some of their possessions and their wealth. Now when Anne appears, apparently the crowd goes silent. So like the execution of George and the other men, there is no jeering, there is no hissing, there is an overall feeling of shock and pity. She is described by an eyewitness as never so beautiful, and also described as having an untroubled countenance. I don't think that means that Anne wasn't scared, of course she would have been afraid of what was going to happen, but with a lot of of Tudor executions, people would be absolutely terrified on the scaffold. I mean, as I said to you, Henry Norris could barely say anything because of his shock. Mark Smeaton stumbled up to the block. The Countess of Salisbury tried to run away from the block. So Anne is remaining dignified and relatively untroubled, but I do think we have to think about that relatively. I don't think that means she was literally untroubled by what was going to happen. So it's Anne's turn now to make her final speech, and Joanna Denny tells us that her voice was surprisingly strong. So I've done a reading of this speech for you, which I'm going to play you in a second. Um, bear in mind, I'm not an actor, I'm nowhere near on the skill level of Dan, who uh, did my amazing George speech, but I've had quite a few positive comments saying that Dan reading uh, the George speech helped people really imagine the events and see them as real, so I thought I would give it a go for this one. Um, forgive me, I'm not an actress. Good Christian people, I have not come here to preach a sermon. I have come here to die. For according to the law and by the law, I am judged to die. And thereof I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak of that whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you. For a gentler, nor a more merciful prince, was there never. And to me, he was ever a good, a gentle, and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world, and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. So Anne's speech is shorter than George's, although it actually echoes him quite a lot in what she says, which is funny because she wouldn't have heard George's speech. It's almost as if the siblings were on a similar wavelength. It seems that Anne doesn't want to go with bitterness or with anger within her. She's very generous to the king in her descriptions of him in this speech. Um, and this could be a genuine generosity and a feeling of pity for him and believing that he has been manipulated by false counsellors. But it also could be for the sake of Elizabeth, because Anne is leaving her nearly three-year-old daughter alone in the world now. If she were to speak up for herself, declare herself innocent, do anything which criticised the king, that would come back on Elizabeth. And we know that Henry has it in him to be that cruel, because he has been that cruel to Lady Mary. So when the speech is finished, Anne removes her gable hood. Underneath there will have been her coif. She then removed her necklaces, and she handed her Bible to one of her ladies-in-waiting. So her next act is that she forgives her executioner. That's the French swordsman from Calais. And that's common practice, because in Tudor times you would forgive your executioner. You don't hold them accountable for hurting you. They are in some ways doing you a service because they're going to try and dispatch you quickly and without pain. And again, some sources say that she paid him, some people say that he was paid up front, so she didn't have to. But what we do know is that the executioner himself was actually quite distressed by what was going on. So in a countdown by Claire Ridgway, um, it's reported that Anne's ladies then removed Anne's mantle and Anne lifted off her gable hood. A young lady presented her with a linen cap 
with which she covered her hair, and she knelt down, fastening her clothes about her feet, and one of the said ladies bandaged her eyes. So this report says that Anne had her eyes covered by a blindfold. This is not consistent with all reports. Some reports tell us that Anne kept looking around uh, at her executioner. Now it could be that she was just hearing him and trying to find out where he was, but it also could have been that she was literally looking at him. We don't know if she was blindfolded. So when all this is done, Anne sinks to her knees, and all the crowd sink to their knees as well out of respect. The only people who don't were apparently the Duke of Suffolk, and Henry Fitzroy. So now all Anne had to do was stay very still and wait for the executioner to strike. So she started praying aloud and she said, O Lord have mercy on me, to God I commend my soul, to Jesus Christ I commend my soul, Lord Jesus receive my soul. So the historian Eric Ives tells us that the only sign of, of real fear in Anne is that she kept looking around at her executioner, probably because she was afraid that he would strike before she was ready, before she was finished praying. Now, apparently, in order to distract Anne and to stop her from becoming too distressed, the executioner called out to his assistant to hand him his sword. And when Anne turned to look at this assistant, the main executioner beheaded her. Thankfully, every report that we have tells us that this was an instant death. It was one stroke and over. She definitely wouldn't have felt any pain. There would have been no time for that. So then the cannon of the Tower of London fired to signify her death. Then her ladies came to wrap her head and body in sheets. Then as the crowd dispersed, Anne's body was carried to the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula within the Tower of London. And there she is alongside her brother George, who has also been placed in this chapel. Now Master Kingston of the Tower later wrote to Cromwell that the Queen died boldly, God take her to his mercy. So during her time at the Tower, it seems that William Kingston has come round to the idea of her innocence and feels pity and mercy for her. He wants her to be happy in the next life and for her to be with God. Now, Anne and George are still there at the Tower of London in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula, and you can visit this chapel when you go to the Tower of London. Um, not at the moment, obviously, because of lockdown, but usually you can be taken in there on a tour and you can actually see the ground under which their bodies are laid. I've been to see them there twice, and it's such a shame that we have lockdown now because I would have gone with Dan to see um, Anne and George's final resting place. We would have gone together and I would have laid some flowers. But if you have enjoyed hearing about Anne and George, then that is something that you can do. If you're in London and you're visiting the Tower of London, go into the chapel and see where they're laid to rest. And it might comfort you to know, it comforts me to know, that they are there together. So this is the end of our story, but it's not really the end of Anne's story because she leaves behind her daughter, who is almost three years old. She leaves behind Elizabeth. Now we know Elizabeth as this golden queen of the golden age. She is one of our most famous monarchs. She is recognized across the globe. After Anne's death, Elizabeth has a really difficult time. She's little, so she doesn't understand fully what's going on, but she was known to be very bright for her age. So she did realize that something was happening. Because she's made a bastard, she is no longer known as the Princess Elizabeth. She is simply known as the Lady Elizabeth. She's reported to have asked the governor of her household at only two years old. Old. How haps it, Governor? Yesterday, my Lady Princess, and today, but my Lady Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth never forgets her mother, and she never stops loving her. In her reign, she praises Henry Norris's conduct in standing up for her mother. She commissions a report into the final events of Anne's life. She wants as much information as she can gather on her mother, and that's difficult for her because so much of this information has been destroyed by her father. Famously, Queen Elizabeth wore a ring, and inside this ring were two portraits, a portrait of herself and a portrait of Anne. So Henry might have tried to smear Anne to get rid of her, to destroy her reputation and to erase her from history, but what he can't do is stop Elizabeth Elizabeth's love for her mother, which endures all her life long. So I want to leave you with a poem written by Thomas Wyatt. Thomas Wyatt was the poet who was friends with George and Anne, who was also held in the tower, but was released because his family were friends with Cromwell. And he wrote a poem about these terrible times and these terrible events. These bloody days, who list his wealth and ease retain, himself let him unknown contain, press not too fast in at the gate, where the return stands by disdain, for sure, circa regna tenat. The high mountains are blasted oft, when the low valley is mild and soft, fortune with health stands at debate, the fall is grievous from aloft, and sure, circa regna tenat.
These bloody days have broken my heart. My lust, my youth, did then depart, and blind desire of estate, who hastes to climb, seeks to revert, of truth, circa, regna, to nat. The bell tower showed me such sight, that in my head sticks day and night. There did I learn, out of a great, for all favour, glory, or might, that yet, circa, regna, to nat. By proof I say, there did I learn, wit helpeth not defence to yearn, of innocency to plead or prate, bear low, therefore, give God the stern, for sure, circa, regna, tenat. Now, the repeated phrase in that poem, circa, regna, tenat, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but what it actually means is thunder rolls around the throne. It thunders around the kingdom. So the idea that if you get too close to the crown, to Henry VIII, who is now a dangerous tyrant, you will fall and you will be destroyed by it. Now, actually, what I have for you, because we've reached the end of this series, is an offering of my own uh, for you and for Anne and George. I have co-written a song with my friend Tudor Acid, and it is called Anne's Final Walk. And it's all about Anne's journey to the scaffold and the thoughts that are going through her head at that time. And I hope that we've managed to capture a feel of her as a person and her terrible situation. So I really hope you enjoy that and you can find that on my channel. I'm gonna put a link to that either here or here. I can't remember which side, but I'm gonna put it either here or here. So uh, thank you so much for going on this journey with me and sticking with me uh, through these videos. Thank you to everyone who's commented and especially to those who are telling me that this is the first time they've really heard about George in this way. Um, that absolutely delights me that more people are learning about him. I hope to make some more history videos in the future, so uh, feel free to leave your suggestions and hopefully now you have the knowledge to correct someone if they talk about Anne and George committing incest or adultery or treason. Hopefully you can put them right now. Okay, I love you loads, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you soon. Okay, love you. Bye!